Great. So again, thanks to everyone for joining us here today. The webinar will be recorded and available to view on our YouTube website and social media pages. Throughout the webinar, we welcome your questions in the chat and we will save time at the end for Q&A with our speakers. So on to our May webinar, an inside look, birds make the best headlines. I'm pleased to introduce National Audubon Society President and CEO David Yarnold, along with experts from Connecticut and New York, and special guests, to showcase some of the incredible and interesting ways that birds are having a moment. Thanks, Sharon. This is David Yarnold. I'm president and the CEO of Audubon. Um, thank you all for joining today. Um, it's true, birds are having a moment. Um, nature and just being outside has never been in more demand. I think we're feeling that in our own lives. We're seeing it all around us. Reporters are calling all the time and asking, are there more birds now or are we just paying attention? Um, and the answer is probably a little bit of both. Um, so literally from the first weeks when we all began working from home, can I have the next slide, please? Literally when we began working from home, it was evident to all of us that this was happening during spring migration and that Audubon had something to offer. The joy, and the opportunity to um, share that with one another. And so we've done a lot over the last six weeks, and I wanna share some of you, some of that with you today. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So these are some of the headlines that we've seen. Some of you might have seen just last Sunday in the New York Times, a big story about native plants um, and uh, the fact, and it mentioned Audubon's zip code based native plants finder three times in that story. We've seen stories here that went uh, across the country via national media outlets um, and we're seeing you know, people uh, coming to our website and um, expressing interest in birding in record numbers. Um, and these are just some of the examples of that. Next slide, please. So even before the media caught on to it, um, we were getting messages from parents and teachers saying, we're stuck inside with kids. What can you give us um, to uh, educate them and uh, delight them? Uh, and so in addition to that, and the fact that we know that Audubon's members, you, um, come to birds uh, in large part because uh, they mean so much to you. Um, we cranked up the content machine and brought a lot of new material to our website. Let's take a look at the next slide. We began to work on uh, what we called a birdie care package, um, and we repurposed some existing content. We created new content, both on the website, from our magazine staff, from our social media staff, um, and people have engaged uh, with, Aud with Audubon in uh, record numbers. In fact, it's enabled us to create brand new kinds of programming. Next slide, please. Our education programming, uh, some of this was um, borrowed from uh, Audubon Adventures. Um, some of it's created fresh. Uh, the website itself, this terrific animated uh, portal to our education material was created uh, by Alex Tomlinson. Um, and it's just full of everything from uh, scavenger hunts to bird knowledge to uh, a 
activities to you know deeper research for older kids or kids of all ages um, and it's a terrific way to engage with birds and with other people who are engaged with birds it's a great site next slide please and the uh, our signature um, uh, initiative was is um, I saw a bird out of on spring migration show. We figured, you know, there's this huge appetite, so let's stand up a, a TV slash Facebook slash Zoom TV show. Um, and we've had guests ranging from Saturday Night Live's um, Melissa Villasenor to uh, Jay Goodall to my neighbor Jane Alexander. Um, all of these folks, these, the, you know, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to see these um, uh, shows. They're an hour or a little longer than that. Um, they're all available on YouTube. Um, just look for Audubon's I Saw Bird. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's Mo Melissa Villasenor uh, on the top right, who drew a ruby throated hummingbird while we were doing the TV show. Um, and these are huge numbers, uh, considering how fundamentally primitive the technology is. Um, we're going to learn a lot from this. And one of the things that I think will have happened through this um, horrible pandemic is that we're all going to be doing a lot more uh, communicating digitally. Um, and Audubon is going to make that pivot um, and continue to produce content like Next slide, please. And the response that we've gotten from the audience is truly heartwarming. I mean, one of the things that I know about bird fans is that birds mean a lot to all of us, um, that we have personal connections with birds. Um, and that's been um, evident in the feedback that we've gotten from people, uh, whether it's around the app, or whether it's around these webinars, or whether it's around the I Saw Bird program, these kinds of comments are heartfelt. Um, uh, and uh, it's pretty, you know, th that to me is a, a privileged position to be in, to be able to talk to people uh, about something that connects them, that creates common ground, across the political landscape, across age groups, across geographies. And you can see from these comments that that's what we've been able to do um, during a very difficult time. Next slide. Uh, we've even created uh, a brand new page where you can, dis you can discover virtual events all across Audubon's network of 460 chapters and 21 nature centers, um, all four flyways, um, and all, all of our 1.8 million members have the opportunity to join any of these events. Um, and this is a new page and something else that we will continue um, and eventually bring to the app as well. Um, So, uh, back to you, Sharon. Next slide. Thanks, David. Everything that you're saying that you're seeing and experiencing at a national level is something that we are seeing at the state level as well here in Connecticut and New York. You see a lot of smiling faces uh, at that bottom photo. Um, that's because something really incredible has come out of this moment. And, you know, in-person connections are pivotal to our conservation work in forests, along our coasts and at our centers. And yet this switch to online programming has really brought about surprising, important, authentic experiences. Um, here in this bottom photo, for instance, you see a group of our staff experts hosting um, a birdie office hours call where we answered any and all questions about birds via Facebook Live. Everyone had so much fun and we were able to provide an incredible amount of education about birds to thousands of people in just 
30 minutes. And uh, now, David, you're about to interview some special guests who are going to speak to this point exactly. This idea that birds and the people who work to protect them are somewhat incredibly really having a moment right now. And the first guest who's going to join us on today's webinar is Ken Elkins. Ken is the Community Conservation Manager for Audubon, Connecticut. Welcome, Ken. Hey there. Ken, uh, love your mural in the background too. Uh, that's one of the 100 plus Audubon um, climate threatened bird murals um, that you can also find on the Audubon website. Um, so thanks for doing that. There's actually an update to that mural that shows those birds with um, uh, masks on, which is quite timely and kind of unfortunate. Um, you've launched a series of incredibly popular multi-day workshops uh, after the quarantine began with topics like birding by ear and warbler identification. What do you think these programs have to offer besides the obvious, the, the educational component? Um, why are they so successful right now? Yeah, that's a great question because I was certainly reluctant at first. I was disappointed as all my in-person workshops with groups at Wesleyan University and other places were being canceled. So uh, making the shift to digital, would people follow us to here? And instead, there is this larger group of people all interested in birding and nature. And I've taken this idea that we should just share skills of how people can enhance their experiences with nature. And I think that's what's really uh, gathering people together the most, that people are excited and they're rescheduling their weeks based, it could have been before on doctor's appointments. One of our participants was emailing me that she now has a new bright spot in her week. Uh, and it's really been exciting to see the conversation going on during these workshops. It's surprising that, you know, when we're on a bird walk, there's the people up at the front always focused on the next bird. And then there are the people at the back having a conversation, meeting the new birders and meeting people that have that same uh, interests. And they're chatting it up in the chat box and becoming new friends and learning and building this whole new community while we're still, in, it's like we're on a bird walk without that. Uh, so we're still in person in that format. It's been pretty exciting. And the audience is bigger. Normally working at Audubon Center, we get 10, 20, 30 people as a great group to be able to drive whatever distance to meet us. And now, since they just have to log in, we're reaching all four corners of the state. They're inviting their friends and family from other states to join them. There are 14 people from 14 states logged in tonight for a Birding by Ear workshop with us. And it's exciting to get to share that experience beyond. And it's gonna be the launch pad that once we can go out in person more often, they're gonna be able to connect with their local chapters or their other local birding groups that we've been sharing their resources beyond Audubon of how to learn what other birds are being sighted in your neighborhood and what you can do to find out how to help birds in your neighborhood too. Hey, can I, let me follow that up real quickly. Do you think people are um, less hesitant to, less reluctant to ask questions um, that, that, you know, they might be a little intimidated to ask if they were like actually out in the field with other people? Yes, we have taught them the option to use the, ask the question just to the co-hosts that I always have one or two colleagues with me that are moderating the chat box and they will read the question without the person's name, but they're able to ask it. And uh, what's great is that when there's a variation of skills already participating, some of the participants are answering. Our Plants for Birds workshop we did last night, exactly that happened. There was more conversation going on in the chat box than what I could share <laughs> at that moment. Um, it was kind of exciting that so much knowledge was being shared and everybody was more excited by the end of that hour. That's great. Sure, you wanna introduce our next guest? Absolutely, thank you so much, Ken. Our next guests are Deb Ribble, who is an Audubon New York board member, and Olivia Lewis, who is a student at the University of Vermont. So Deb and Olivia, come on on and join us. Hi, oh. Deb. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, how are you? <laughs> sorry about that. There's just, uh, my phone's going off. Um, Hi. Hi, Deb. Hi, Olivia. 
Um, so, uh, Olivia, you, you met Deb through your environmental studies class at the University of Vermont. Yes. Um, and you were paired with Deb as a bird mentor, but you had to go birding together over the phone. Yes. And apparently, this was a huge success. Can you tell us about that experience? Um, yeah, so traditionally, if we were in our classes, we would have gone birding just as a group, a group of students. Um, but due to these circumstances, everyone actually got paired up with an Audubon Society member. So it was just very interesting and very rewarding to be able to go one-on-one -on -one with someone who, like Deb, who knows so much about birding and have her be able us be able to do something one-on-one -on -one instead of just a group of kind of novices and rookies and uh, trying to figure it out all together. Um, but it was great. I mean, we went for like two hours or something and it was just it was my first experience into birding and I had a great time. So Deb, what was it like going birding over the phone? Did you like literally go outside and were you spotting birds? What were you doing? Okay, well, Olivia was taking a walk in a park near her. I was, okay. on, I was on my roof in the city. So we had two completely different experiences, which was actually uh, really kind of fun. I like that. And um, I, I have to say, I was a little hesitant about this. I was not sure how this was going to work. But um, I... I have to say, I'm really excited to have been able to do this because it made me completely rethink what I do when I take someone who's a novice out birding. I mean, typically, I take somebody out, I try to find as many birds as I can, try to identify them, and then I like to talk about behavior because I think that helps people relate to birds and people are really interested in that. And we did a, a lot of that, right, on our walk. Mm -hmm. But to make this work, Olivia had to help with the identification. <laughs> it wasn't going to work any other way because she's a really good spotter and she would find birds and the only way I could see them because I couldn't see anything except for her very attractive face was <laughs> he'd have to describe them to me. So I did something I normally don't do when I take somebody out the first time which is we did a crash course in bird identification. Just really basic things, so she would be able to easily describe what the bird looked like. And man, she picked it up immediately. <laughs> really, that is, very good. And so, anyway, when she'd see a bird, she'd know exactly what to say. You know, she's talking about the beak, any kind of wing bars, or where they were, like their habitat, where they on the ground, where they in a tree, um, just sort of their shape um, and what they were doing. And she caught on instantly. And we, I, you know, I should have, I should have memorized it. I think, what did we see? Like 19 birds or 22 birds or something? In it was a lot. It was a, we saw quite a few. Hours. Yeah, on a day when it was raining during the day <laughs> and windy. And she was in a park in, what was it, like a month ago? Something like that. So I think it was really pretty uh, terrific. And I have discovered that I think this is a really important thing to do when I take somebody new out. Because... Um, I, I think you need to learn this early on, and I kind of wished I had learned it early on because I will say my weak link is actually bird identification, and I think it's like, uh -huh. like riding in the right seat of a car. If you're always a passenger and somebody is always driving and they know the route, you never get to learn anything. So thank you, David. Thank you, Audubon, for making this um, opportunity for me because it's really been extremely helpful. And I, it was a delight meeting you, Olivia, and I hope it was fun. I yeah, no, I had an amazing time and just, it was so interesting because it's just a whole new world that I've never really explored. And just for Deb to be able to take the two things about a bird that I could tell her and give me so many options for what I could look up for what it could be was just, it was very impressive and I ended up having a really good time. That's great. That's really an amazing story. Just so you know the backstory, um, University of Vermont is one of 115 Audubon campus chapters. And because students aren't physically on campus, that's about a year and a half old program now. And, you know, we expect to be, we expected to be at 150 chapters by September. and We may still be. Um, but because students weren't on campus, the environmental studies program said we have 200 students but the thing is, every one of them needs a mentor. So we paired up 200 students with mentors. And it is amazing to hear that you went out birding together and you spotted 
20 species. I can't imagine the pressure, Devin. I, I deem the species based on descriptions. Good for you, Olivia. It sounds like you That's really me. did a she great really job. Good. If she good had not you. been as good a spotter or as good in, in catching on how to do the descriptions, I don't know this would have worked so well. You are really, really awesome. awesome. She's awesome, yeah. That's really great. <laughs> All right, Sharon, why don't you introduce our next guest? Thanks, Deb and Olivia. Our next guest is Ann Swain. Ann is the executive director of the Sawmill River Audubon uh, chapter. Hey guys. Hi, Ann. Hey. Having a little hiccup here with the video, of course. Let's get that. Yep. Hey, David. There we go. How Hi, you doing? David. Good, we're doing well. Good, so we're neighbors. Um, and I know that, uh, Ann, you've launched weekly online bird chats with local experts and beginners who wanna know more about birds. And I know many of our local chapters depend on in-person bird walks as to engage with their members. So how, does, how do those compare with these online experiences? Uh, well, nothing compares with the delight of sharing the view of um, a soaring eagle or an oriole building the nest, but in the online bird chats, people are sharing pictures and videos. Uh, we're also sharing sound files to learn about who's singing now. Uh, because I think like you mentioned in the beginning, David, people are really noticing bird song now, maybe because they're home in the mornings more. Uh, and people are sharing information about where they're doing solo birding. Uh, good places to go uh, during the migration, the hot spots. And I think, I think it's true, people are very much more tuned in now. We're seeing a huge increase in people visiting county parks and our own sanctuaries. Um, and and the idea of that I think Ken might have mentioned of people being comfortable to ask the questions in chat and have people of all different levels sharing ideas is something we're seeing online too. And it's, it's, really, uh, it's really surprised us, the amount of community building that's happened uh, with that, with that online community. So it's encouraging, yeah. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, and it couldn't have happened um, at a better time for seeing birds. My, on Mother's Day, we went for a walk um, near Terrytown on the trail up there. And my 23-year-old daughter said, are those cardinals over there? And in this patch of sunlight in this wooded spot, it weren't cardinals, there were two scarlet tanagers out there in the middle of the afternoon in this brightly lit spot and it, just beacons of red and black. I mean, it was just fabulous. Yeah, that's the big, uh, the big bird celebrities this spring have really made the news on social media. We're thinking that the, the scarlet tanagers may have been feeding lower this spring because of the cold temperatures. So people are seeing them much lower down in their yard, uh, the orioles, rose-breasted grosbeaks. So um, they, they're catching everyone's eye and ear and uh, people want to talk about it. It's good. That's, re that's, that's really terrific. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ann. Appreciate thank that. You. Good. Thanks for all you do. Sharon, Thanks. you want to introduce our uh, last guest? Sure, David. Last but not least, we have uh, two guests. Ryan McLean, the bird education specialist at the Greenwich Audubon Center, and Eli Schaefer, the Greenwich Audubon Center director. Everyone, thank you, David and Sharon, for having us. We're so glad to be here. Hello. Hi, Ryan and Eli. It's nice to see both of you. Um, so, so Ryan, you, you become quite a familiar face on Facebook these days. Twice a week, you wake up at dawn and you take your cell phone out onto the grounds of the Greenwich Audubon Center and you broadcast and identify everything you hear. Um, how has uh, social media allowed you to stay connected with the center's local community? And do you think that you're actually reaching more people now than you did when the center was fully open? Absolutely, we are. Um, normally at this time of year, we would be hosting spring bird walks, which brings in a very big and vibrant birding community. Up until this year, a lot of those were led by um, my greatest mentor and friend, Ted Gilman, here. Um, but now since we couldn't do them due to the circumstances, we wanted to provide an outlet for the birding community to still gather, but also to provide something educational and therapeutic for everyone. Um, our colleague, Caroline Bailey, 
and I had already been creating videos when this idea came about. And Caroline has been a major part of these videos as well, um, especially Ken mentioned comment sections. Um, she has been instrumental in making sure people who leave comments are replied to and appreciate it right away. So I can't overstate how great of a role she's played in this and as part of this team as well. Um, it pleasantly surprised us to see how people react, even through a phone, hearing a rose-breasted grow speak and then also learning how its song is different than a robin, or even seeing I was even able to digiscope some birds live, including wood ducks, even a pair of barred owls during one of our sunset sessions. And on our first video, we had people as far away as Australia joining us, saying that they loved coming, having a chance to come birding with us. So the greatest surprise in this situation is now our birding community has gone from local to global and has connected so many more friends to us and to nature, wherever they may be. Yeah. I, Any, yeah, I was gonna ask you about your experience, Eli. Well, I was gonna say that uh, I think Dawn Chorus in particular has been such a success because it exemplifies the connections to nature that uh, the Greenwich Center staff have been facilitating for over 75 years. And just taking a camera to um, one of our favorite locations, two of the Greenwich sanctuaries, our main sanctuary and the Fairchild Sanctuary. Um, and by hearing the sounds of spring migration and seeing the habitat those birds depend on, participants are really immersed in a quintessential birding experience right through their screens. So the last piece, and I think the key to making it an authentic Audubon program is the presence of an expert bird naturalist, Ryan, um, to translate the sounds of spring migration into a learning experience. Uh, and like Ryan mentioned, with additional staff responding to comments in real time, participants leave feeling engaged, enriched, and wanting more. And really, I think that's what we're aiming for, so that people who engage with us online know they're part of our center community they're, they're part of the greater Audubon family. And um, of course, they can always go to our website or our social media pages to see you know, what's next on the, on the calendar. That's great. Um, thank you both. Uh, the, the Greenwich Dawn Chorus has quite the following. Um, Sharon, back to you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks. Ryan and Eli. Uh, so David, before we open it up to questions from the audience about the joy of birds and how birding has changed, maybe for the better, um, we wanted to share just a few more ways that folks can get involved with Audubon. So I believe we have one last slide to share. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot that you can do um, uh, in your communities at the state level and in terms of federal regulation and oversight. Um, uh, birds, birds are amazing creatures. We all know that. Um, you know, a, a ruby-throated hummingbird can migrate 19 hours overnight across the Gulf of Mexico losing half of its body weight. But there's a couple things that that ruby-throated hummingbird can't do that you can do. Number one is it can't write a check. And number two is, most importantly, it can't vote and it can't take action. You can. So I'd urge you to go to this website and find opportunities for you to get involved. Back to you, Sharon. Thank you so much. So at this point, we're going to move into our Q&A. I want to remind everyone who's watching that these webinars are recorded. Uh, you might be watching via Facebook. They'll be available via Facebook after this is over. And if you're watching via Zoom, they're recorded and posted to our YouTube website and social media pages. Um, David, as well as today's special guests are here. They remain with us to answer any questions you might have about why or how birds are having a moment. So please type your questions into the chat box and our full group of panelists will be available to answer them. 
we'll do our best to answer as many as we can out loud, um, but we might have to take some via the chat if we get a lot of questions coming in. So David, the first question is for you, and that is looking forward, what is the one best way that this has changed Audubon for the future? Uh, I think that all of the, I, I think more people can participate without having to get up at six in the morning or drive somewhere. I mean, we've seen that. I mean, and, and we're seeing, I was just, I, I get transfixed by the chats. Um, and there was a chat, chat comment about, it was an observation about how on bird walks, people tend to walk in single file and, you know, they can only talk to the people who are right in front of them. Um, and this, you know, this is the opportunity to broaden Audubon's base, to share our joy for birds with more people, um, to build a, a more diverse Audubon, um, and to acquire new skills. And one of the things that's happening is that a lot of Audubon staff are learning by doing, um, and I, I appreciate that. And I think that uh, this, this shift to digital will be something that is um, ongoing. Um, so we have a question about how Audubon has been able to engage teachers and students at this time. David, maybe you could start by uh, just talking a little bit more about Audubon for kids, since some folks may have joined us, since you uh, explained what that website is all about. And um, then Eli and Ryan, maybe you could speak a bit about how the centers are uh, still engaging in education work. Sure. So, um, uh, six weeks ago, early on, when we all realized that we were going to be shut-ins, um, we created a new landing page for parents and teachers. Um, it's an Audubon education page. Um, and there's a ton of content on there, everything from lessons to bird identification to quizzes to scavenger hunts. Um, and it's stuff that can be done inside. It's stuff that can be done in your neighborhood. Um, with safe social distancing. So there's a lot of content on Audubon now and um, all of that content is also available in Spanish in Audubon and, and Espanol. Thanks, that's great. I was hoping you'd mention that because we also got a question, can Audubon offer walks or talks for Spanish speaking folks? So Ryan and Eli, uh, and Ken, I see you joined us, but Ryan, Eli, why don't you start? Uh, how are we continuing to engage teachers and, and students? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so te uh, the teachers that we were in touch with for spring field trips, uh, we, we got in touch with them pretty early on and saw that uh, there was a variety of need and capacity on their end. So uh, Audubon, I think, has accommodated that pretty well by having a variety of options for them. So our center has been doing a lot of live programming, uh, programming that can be recorded and then posted and used as needed. Um, I also know that uh, Ken, uh, Ken Elkins has been um, developing uh, material that teachers will be able to incorporate into their uh, um, distance learning. And we're also uh, actually in the next week or two uh, going to be doing our first uh, virtual field trips with classrooms. Uh, and, and so I think those pieces together can kind of meet teachers and families where they are. I also just want to add to that that one of the extremely unique features of our education programs at our center has been a big part of our family has been an incredible team of volunteer teacher naturalists who have, some of them have been teaching here for many, many years. And um, even though we aren't having school programs here on site at the moment, um, we've been making sure we've been still in touch with these people to let them know they are still part of our family and they are such a crucial part of this. And so we are hoping that they are gonna be involved with us in this as well as we continue to, we've had Zoom meetings with them to discuss what they think, what their ideas are and how we can move forward together in this new landscape to continue to, even though school buses aren't showing up at our doors, how we can still bring this 
similar but different but still enjoyable nature experience to children ages one to 101. I'd like to just add that our school teachers who really uh, value Audubon as a part of their science curriculum and their school curriculum have been the ones reaching out to us the most and they have really found all of those materials in Audubon for kids to be of great value but then to have that local connection we are producing for them on a limited basis uh, recorded videos and they're embedding them into their Google classrooms or whatever distance learning materials they're using and it becomes something that they can use at their own pace uh, and it's exciting because then it's something that the students can go back and view at their own pace and they can review things on a multiple times where when we're out in nature, it happens once and then it's done. Uh, and they might have been looking the wrong direction and now they get to rewind it and watch that same phenomenon happening multiple times. Thanks all. We have a question for uh, David and for Olivia. So Olivia, what have you um, kept birding since your experience with Deb? And what is the best bird that you've seen? And David, the follow-up question is, have you been out birding in New York City? And what is that like? Olivia? Um, so I haven't done a lot of birding since, but I mean, with this time, I've been trying to get out into nature and it's definitely something that I notice a lot more when I'm out. So I've gone a few hikes and I've definitely opened up the birding apps and birding guides that I downloaded for my trip with Deb. And um, it's just a, another interesting aspect to look at um, and something that I never really noticed before, but I definitely find myself thinking about more and more now. Um, and for the best or coolest bird that I've seen right at the end of my birding trip with Deb. We saw the palm warbler, which was really great to see and really exciting. <laughs> so, yeah. That's very cool. And, and did Deb help you ID that through a phone, through your description? Yeah, so there was- Very just, impressive. Yeah, there was this one bird, we could hear it. She could hear it through my phone the entire day. We were trying to figure out what it was and I couldn't see it. And then right at the end, we saw it and it was just a, it was a great moment to finally find that one that we couldn't figure That's out. That's great. That's great. Um, so I have not been birding in New York City uh, since I left work on March 8th or 9th. Um, but I have the good fortune of living on uh, a, wood, uh, a wooded trail and my backyard looks like a Disney movie between the deer and all the birds and the raccoons that are crossing my lawn and, you know, through my native plants. It's like, um, so I see lots of birds. I had some goldfinches uh, a couple of weeks ago. We have a pair of cardinals that we watch every day. Um, the three people who uh, I live with have become bad. They actually watch the birds at the feeders as opposed to noticing all the activity. So, you know, I've been pointing out five or six different types of sparrows and we go for walks and there, there are some pretty aggressive mockingbirds out on the trail in front of my house. Um, but, you know, every day I see 20 or 30 species. It's terrific. Thanks, David. And uh, people have been asking great questions in the chat that are, are very specific questions about particular birds. And our science staff is in the chat answering your questions. So thank you for asking. Uh, David, one final question for you, which is, um, is there any particular audience that Audubon wasn't reaching before or wasn't reaching as much that you now feel more strongly connected with? Um, I think parents, I think parents with young kids um, I, you know, m my son has a six-year-old and a three-year-old and, you know, the, the, the endless, you know, Zoom lessons for kids of all ages has, it's turned every parent into a teacher and, you know, all of us want to thank, um, all of the essential workers who, you know, who do the, those jobs, um, I even during this time. Um, so I think, you know, Audubon's audience is growing in its breadth and its diversity. 
Um, we want to make sure that burning and the outdoors are accessible to everybody, um, that everybody feels welcome, um, and to broaden Audubon's base. And I think particularly um, folks who have come to our website for the education site, um, I think that, that that's created a new audience. And I think that um, these webinars do, and I think that the um, I saw a bird Audubon spring migration show um, with upwards of 25,000 people a week has created some new friends too. And tonight, we'll on tonight at seven o'clock Eastern and we have a number of um, uh, guests. We're going to talk about Audubon's international uh, work with um, everybody from folks representing the boreal forest to Colombia. So tune in. Thanks, David. That's fantastic. And I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, so thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We had hundreds of people on this call from all across our two states, Connecticut, New York, and Shirley from beyond. Uh, David and all of our panelists, Olivia, Ken, Ryan, Eli, Anne, and Deb, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you want to watch this webinar or share it afterwards, you can always uh, find it on our YouTube or Facebook channels. And we'll see you on the third Wednesday of every month, as well as next month. Thanks to everyone for joining and thank you again, David.